Part One of Philebos. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jeffrey Edwards. Philebos by Plato. Translated by Benjamin Joet. Persons of the Dialogue. Socrates, Protarchus, Philebos. Socrates, observe, Protarchus, the nature of the position which you are now going to take from Philebos, and what the other position is which I maintain, and which, if you do not approve of it, is to be controverted by you. Shall you and I sum up the two sides? Protarchus, by all means. Socrates, Philebos was saying that enjoyment and pleasure and delight, and the class of feelings akin to them, are a good to every living being, whereas I contend that not these, but wisdom and intelligence and memory, and their kindred, right opinion and true reasoning, are better and more desirable than pleasure for all who are able to partake of them, and that to all such who are, or ever will be, they are the most advantageous of all things. Have I not given Philebos a fair statement of the two sides of the argument? Philebos, nothing could be fairer socrates socrates and do you protarchus accept the position which is assigned to you protarchus i cannot do otherwise since our excellent philebos has left the field socrates surely the truth about these matters ought by all means to be ascertained protarchus certainly socrates shall we further agree protarchus to what socrates that you and I must now try to indicate some state and disposition of the soul which has the property of making all men happy. Protarchus. Yes, by all means. Socrates. And you say that pleasure, and I say that wisdom is such a state? Protarchus. True. Socrates. And what if there be a third state which is better than either? Then both of us are vanquished, are we not? But if this life which really has the power of making men happy, turn out to be more akin to pleasure than to wisdom, the life of pleasure may still have the advantage over the life of wisdom. Protarchus, true. Socrates, or suppose that the better life is more nearly allied to wisdom, then wisdom conquers and pleasure is defeated. Do you agree? Protarchus, certainly. Socrates, and what do you say, Philebos? Philebos, I say, and shall always say, that pleasure is easily the conqueror, but you must decide for yourself, Protarchus. Protarchus, you, Philebos, have handed over the argument to me, and have no longer a voice in the matter? Philebos, true enough. Nevertheless, I would clear myself and deliver my soul of you, and I call the goddess herself to witness that I now do so. Protarchus, you may appeal to us, we too will be the witnesses of your words. And now, Socrates, whether Philebos is pleased or displeased, we will proceed with the argument. Socrates. Then let us begin with the goddess herself, of whom Philebos says that she is called Aphrodite, but that her real name is Pleasure. Protarchus. Very good. Socrates. The awe which I always feel, Protarchus, about the names of the gods is more than human. It exceeds all other fears, and now I would not sin against Aphrodite by naming her amiss. Let her be called what she pleases. But pleasure I know to be manifold, and with her, as I was just now saying, we must begin, and consider what her nature is. She has one name, and therefore you would imagine that she is one, and yet surely she takes the most varied and even unlike forms, for do we not say that the intemperate has pleasure, and that the temperate has pleasure in his very temperance, that the fool is pleased when he is full of foolish fancies and hopes, and that the wise man has pleasure in his wisdom? And how foolish would any one be who affirmed that all these opposite pleasures are severally alike? Protarchus, why, Socrates, they are opposed in so far as they spring from opposite sources, but they are not in themselves opposite for must not pleasure be of all things most absolutely like pleasure that is like itself socrates yes my good friend 
just as colour is like colour in so far as colours are colours there is no difference between them and yet we all know that black is not only unlike but even absolutely opposed to white or again as figure is like figure for all figures are comprehended under one class and yet particular figures may be absolutely opposed to one another and there is an infinite diversity of them and we might find similar examples in many other things therefore do not rely upon this argument which would go to prove the unity of the most extreme opposites and i suspect that we shall find a similar opposition among pleasures protarchus very likely but how will this invalidate the argument socrates why i shall reply that dissimilar as they are you apply to them a new predicate for you say that all pleasant things are good now although no one can argue that pleasure is not pleasure he may argue as we are doing that pleasures are oftener bad than good but you call them all good and at the same time are compelled if you are pressed to acknowledge that they are unlike and so you must tell us what is the identical quality existing alike in good and bad pleasures which makes you designate all of them as good protarchus what do you mean socrates do you think that any one who asserts pleasure to be the good will tolerate the notion that some pleasures are good and others bad socrates and yet you will acknowledge that they are different from one another and sometimes opposed protarchus not in so far as they are pleasures socrates that is a return to the old position protarchus and so we are to say are we that there is no difference in pleasures but that they are all alike and the examples which have just been cited do not pierce our dull minds but we go on arguing all the same like the weakest and most inexperienced reasoners protarchus what do you mean socrates why i mean to say that in self-defence i may if i like follow your example and assert boldly that the two things most unlike are most absolutely alike and the result will be that you and i will prove ourselves to be very tyros in the art of disputing and the argument will be blown away and lost suppose that we put back and return to the old position then perhaps we may come to an understanding with one another protarchus how do you mean socrates shall i protarchus have my own question asked of me by you protarchus what question socrates ask me whether wisdom and science and mind and those other qualities which i when asked by you at first what is the nature of the good affirmed to be good are not in the same case with the pleasures of which you spoke protarchus what do you mean socrates the sciences are a numerous class and will be found to present great differences but even admitting that like the pleasures they are opposite as well as different should i be worthy of the name of dialectician if in order to avoid this difficulty i were to say as you are saying of pleasure that there is no difference between one science and another would not the argument founder and disappear like an idle tale although we might ourselves escape drowning by clinging to a fallacy protarchus may none of this befall us except the deliverance yet i like the even-handed justice which is applied to both our arguments let us assume then that there are many and diverse pleasures and many and different sciences socrates and let us have no concealment protarchus of the differences between my good and yours but let us bring them to the light in the hope that in the process of testing them they may show whether pleasure is to be called the good or wisdom or some third quality for surely we are not now simply contending in order that my view or that yours may prevail but i presume that we ought both of us to be fighting for the truth protarchus certainly we ought socrates then let us have a more definite understanding and establish the principle on which the argument rests protarchus what principle socrates a principle about which all men are always in a difficulty and some men sometimes against their will protarchus speak plainer socrates the principle which has just turned up which is a marvel of nature for that one should be many or many one are wonderful propositions and he who affirms either is very open to attack protarchus 
do you mean when a person says that i protarchus am by nature one and also many dividing the single me into many me's and even opposing them as great and small light and heavy and in ten thousand other ways socrates those protarchus are the common and acknowledged paradoxes about the one and many which i may say that everybody has by this time agreed to dismiss as childish and obvious and detrimental to the true course of thought and no more favour is shown to that other puzzle in which a person proves the members and parts of anything to be divided and then confessing that they are all one says laughingly in disproof of his own words why here is a miracle the one is many and infinite and the many are only one protarchus but what socrates are those other marvels connected with this subject which as you imply have not yet become common and acknowledged socrates when my boy the one does not belong to the class of things that are born and perish as in the instances which we were giving for in those cases and when unity is of this concrete nature there is as i was saying a universal consent that no refutation is needed but when the assertion is made that man is one or ox is one or beauty one or the good one then the interest which attaches to these and similar unities and the attempt which is made to divide them gives birth to a controversy protarchus of what nature socrates in the first place as to whether these unities have a real existence and then how each individual unity being always the same and incapable either of generation or of destruction but retaining a permanent individuality can be conceived either as dispersed and multiplied in the infinity of the world of generation or as still entire and yet divided from itself which latter would seem to be the greatest impossibility of all for how can one and the same thing be at the same time in one and in many things these protarchos are the real difficulties and this is the one and many to which they relate they are the source of great perplexity if ill-decided and the right determination of them is very helpful protarchos then socrates let us begin by clearing up these questions socrates that is what i should wish protarchos and i am sure that all my other friends will be glad to hear them discussed philebos fortunately for us is not disposed to move and we had better not stir him up with questions socrates good and where shall we begin this great and multifarious battle in which such various points are at issue shall we begin thus protarchus how socrates we say that the one and many become identified by thought and that now as in time past they run about together in and out of every word which is uttered and that this union of them will never cease and is not now beginning but is as i believe an everlasting quality of thought itself which never grows old any young man when he first tastes these subtleties is delighted and fancies that he has found a treasure of wisdom in the first enthusiasm of his joy he leaves no stone or rather no thought unturned now rolling up the many into the one and kneading them together now unfolding and dividing them he puzzles himself first and above all and then he proceeds to puzzle his neighbours whether they are older or younger or of his own age that makes no difference neither father nor mother does he spare no human being who has ears is safe from him hardly even his dog and a barbarian would have no chance of escaping him if an interpreter could only be found protarchus considering socrates how many we are and that all of us are young men is there not a danger that we and philebos may all set upon you if you abuse us we understand what you mean but is there no charm by which we may dispel all this confusion no more excellent way of arriving at the truth if there is we hope that you will guide us into that way and we will do our best to follow for the inquiry in which we are engaged socrates is not unimportant socrates the reverse of unimportant my boys as philebos calls you and there neither is nor ever will be a better than my own favourite way which has nevertheless already often deserted me and left me helpless in the hour of need 
Protarchus, tell us what that is. Socrates, one which may be easily pointed out, but is by no means easy of application. It is the parent of all the discoveries in the arts. Protarchus, tell us what it is. Socrates, a gift of heaven, which, as I conceive, the gods tossed among men by the hands of a new Prometheus, and therewith a blaze of light, and the ancients, who were our betters and nearer the gods than we are, handed down the tradition that whatever things are said to be are composed of one and many, and have the finite and infinite implanted in them. Seeing, then, that such is the order of the world, we too ought in every inquiry to begin by laying down one idea of that which is the subject of inquiry. This unity we shall find in everything. Having found it, we may next proceed to look for two, if there be two, or if not, then for three, or some other number, subdividing each of these units, until at last the unity with which we began is seen not only to be one and many and infinite, but also a definite number. The infinite must not be suffered to approach the many until the entire number of the species intermediate between unity and infinity has been discovered. Then, and not till then, we may rest from division, and without further troubling ourselves about the endless individuals, may allow them to drop into infinity. This, as I was saying, is the way of considering and learning and teaching one another, which the gods have handed down to us. But the wise men of our time are either too quick or too slow in conceiving plurality in unity. Having no method, they make their one and many anyhow, and from unity pass at once to infinity. The intermediate steps never occur to them. And this, I repeat, is what makes the difference between the mere art of disputation and true dialectic. Protarchus, I think that I partly understand you, Socrates but I should like to have a clearer notion of what you are saying. Socrates, I may illustrate my meaning by the letters of the alphabet, Protarchus, which you were made to learn as a child. Protarchus, how do they afford an illustration? Socrates, the sound which passes through the lips, whether of an individual or of all men, is one and yet infinite. Protarchus, very true. Socrates, and yet, not by knowing either that sound is one or that sound is infinite are we perfect in the art of speech but the knowledge of the number and nature of sounds is what makes a man a grammarian protarchus very true socrates and the knowledge which makes a man a musician is of the same kind protarchus how so socrates sound is one in music as well as in grammar protarchus certainly socrates and there is a higher note and a lower note and a note of equal pitch. May we affirm so much? Protarchus. Yes. Socrates. But you would not be a real musician if this was all that you knew, though if you did not know this, you would know almost nothing of music. Protarchus. Nothing. Socrates. But when you have learned what sounds are high and what low, and the number and nature of the intervals, and their limits or proportions, and the systems compounded out of them, which our fathers discovered, and have handed down to us, who are their descendants, under the name of harmonies, and the affections corresponding to them in the movements of the human body, which, when measured by numbers, ought, as they say, to be called rhythms and measures, and they tell us that the same principle should be applied to every one and many. When, I say, you have learned all this, then, my dear friend, you are perfect, and you may be said to understand any other subject when you have a similar grasp of it. But the infinity of kinds, and the infinity of individuals, which there is in each of them, when not classified, creates in every one of us a state of infinite ignorance, and he who never looks for number in anything will not himself be looked for in the number of famous men. Protarchus, I think that what Socrates is now saying is excellent, Philebos. Philebos, I think so too, but how do his words bear upon us and upon the argument? Socrates, Philebos is right in asking that question of us, Protarchus. Protarchus, indeed he is, and you must answer him. Socrates, I will, but you must let me make one little remark first about these matters. I was saying that he who begins with any individual unity should proceed from that, 
not to infinity but to a definite number and now i say conversely that he who has to begin with infinity should not jump to unity but he should look about for some number representing a certain quantity and thus out of all end in one and now let us return for an illustration of our principle to the case of letters protarchus what do you mean socrates some god or divine man who in the egyptian legend is said to have been thoth observing that the human voice was infinite first distinguished in this infinity a certain number of vowels and then other letters which had sound but were not pure vowels i e the semivowels these two exist in a definite number and lastly he distinguished a third class of letters which we now call mutes without voice and without sound and divided these and likewise the two other classes of vowels and semivowels into the individual sounds and told the number of them and gave to each and all of them the name of letters and observing that none of us could learn any one of them and not learn them all and in consideration of this common bond which in a manner united them he assigned to them all a single art and this he called the art of grammar or letters philobos the illustration protarchus has assisted me in understanding the original statement but i still feel the defect of which i just now complained socrates are you going to ask philobos what this has to do with the argument philobos yes that is a question which protarchus and i have been long asking socrates assuredly you have already arrived at the answer to the question which as you say you have been so long asking philobos how so socrates did we not begin by inquiring into the comparative eligibility of pleasure and wisdom philobos certainly socrates and we maintain that they are each of them one philobos true socrates and the precise question to which the previous discussion desires an answer is how they are one and also many i e how they have one genus and many species and are not at once infinite and what number of species is to be assigned to either of them before they pass into infinity protarchus that is a very serious question philobos to which socrates has ingeniously brought us round and please to consider which of us shall answer him there may be something ridiculous in my being unable to answer and therefore imposing the task upon you when i have undertaken the whole charge of the argument but if neither of us were able to answer the result methinks would be still more ridiculous let us consider then what we are to do socrates if i understood him correctly is asking whether there are not kinds of pleasure and what is the number and nature of them and the same of wisdom socrates most true o son of callias and the previous argument showed that if we are not able to tell the kinds of everything that has unity likeness sameness or their opposites none of us will be of the smallest use in any inquiry protarchus that seems to be very near the truth socrates happy would the wise man be if he knew all things and the next best thing for him is that he should know himself why do i say so at this moment i will tell you you socrates have granted us this opportunity of conversing with you and are ready to assist us in determining what is the best of human goods for when philobos said that pleasure and delight and enjoyment and the like were the chief good you answered no not those but another class of goods and we are constantly reminding ourselves of what you said and very properly in order that we may not forget to examine and compare the two and these goods which in your opinion are to be designated as superior to pleasure and are the true objects of pursuit are mind and knowledge and understanding and art and the like there was a dispute about which were the best and we playfully threatened that you should not be allowed to go home until the question was settled and you agreed and placed yourself at our disposal and now as children say what has been fairly given cannot be taken back cease then to fight against us in this way socrates in what way philobos do not perplex us and keep asking questions of us to which we have not as yet any sufficient answer to give let us not imagine that a general puzzling of us all is to be the end of our discussion but if we are unable to answer 
do you answer as you have promised consider then whether you will divide pleasure and knowledge according to their kinds or you may let the matter drop if you are able and willing to find some other mode of clearing up our controversy socrates if you say that i have nothing to apprehend for the words if you are willing dispel all my fear and moreover a god seems to have recalled something to my mind philebus what is that socrates i remember to have heard long ago certain discussions about pleasure and wisdom whether awake or in a dream i cannot tell they were to the effect that neither the one nor the other of them was the good but some third thing which was different from them and better than either if this be clearly established then pleasure will lose the victory for the good will cease to be identified with her am i not right protarchus yes socrates and there will cease to be any need of distinguishing the kinds of pleasures as i am inclined to think but this will appear more clearly as we proceed protarchus capital socrates pray go on as you propose socrates but let us first agree on some little points protarchus what are they socrates is the good perfect or imperfect protarchus the most perfect socrates of all things socrates and is the good sufficient protarchus yes certainly and in a degree surpassing all other things socrates and no one can deny that all percipient beings desire and hunt after good and are eager to catch and have the good about them and care not for the attainment of anything which is not accompanied by good protarchus that is undeniable socrates now let us part off the life of pleasure from the life of wisdom and pass them in review protarchus how do you mean socrates let there be no wisdom in the life of pleasure nor any pleasure in the life of wisdom for if either of them is the chief good it cannot be supposed to want anything but if either is shown to want anything then it cannot really be the chief good protarchus impossible socrates and will you help us to test these two lives protarchus certainly socrates then answer protarchus ask socrates would you choose protarchus to live all your life long in the enjoyment of the greatest pleasures protarchus certainly i should socrates would you consider that there was still anything wanting to you if you had perfect pleasure protarchus certainly not socrates reflect would you not want wisdom and intelligence and forethought and similar qualities would you not at any rate want sight protarchus why should i having pleasure i should have all things socrates living thus you would always throughout your life enjoy the greatest pleasures protarchus i should socrates but if you had neither mind nor memory nor knowledge nor true opinion you would in the first place be utterly ignorant of whether you were pleased or not because you would be entirely devoid of intelligence protarchus certainly socrates and similarly if you had no memory you would not recollect that you had ever been pleased nor would the slightest recollection of the pleasure which you feel at any moment remain with you and if you had no true opinion you would not think that you were pleased when you were and if you had no power of calculation you would not be able to calculate on future pleasure and your life would be the life not of a man but of an oyster or pulmo marinus could this be otherwise protarchus no socrates but is such a life eligible protarchus i cannot answer you socrates the argument has taken away from me the power of speech socrates we must keep up our spirits let us now take the life of mind and examine it in turn protarchus and what is this life of mind socrates i want to know whether any one of us would consent to live having wisdom and mind and knowledge and memory of all things but having no sense of pleasure or pain and wholly unaffected by these and the like feelings protarchus neither life socrates appears eligible to me nor is likely as i should imagine to be chosen by any one else socrates what would you say protarchus to both of these in one or to one that was made out of the union of the two protarchus 
out of the union that is of pleasure with mind and wisdom socrates yes that is the life which i mean protarchus there can be no difference of opinion not some but all would surely choose this third rather than either of the other two and in addition to them socrates but do you see the consequence protarchus to be sure i do the consequence is that two out of the three lives which have been proposed are neither sufficient nor eligible for man or for animal socrates then now there can be no doubt that neither of them has the good for the one which had would certainly have been sufficient and perfect and eligible for every living creature or thing that was able to live such a life and if any of us had chosen any other he would have chosen contrary to the nature of the truly eligible and not of his own free will but either through ignorance or from some unhappy necessity protarchus certainly that seems to be true socrates and now have i not sufficiently shown that philebus's goddess is not to be regarded as identical with the good philebus neither is your mind the good socrates for that will be open to the same objections socrates perhaps philebus you may be right in saying so of my mind but of the true which is also the divine mind far otherwise however i will not at present claim the first place for mind as against the mixed life but we must come to some understanding about the second place for you might affirm pleasure and i mind to be the cause of the mixed life and in that case although neither of them would be the good one of them might be imagined to be the cause of the good and i might proceed further to argue in opposition to philebus that the element which makes this mixed life eligible and good is more akin and more similar to mind than to pleasure and if this is true pleasure cannot be truly said to share either in the first or second place and does not if i may trust my own mind attain even to the third protarchus truly socrates pleasure appears to me to have had a fall in fighting for the palm she has been smitten by the argument and is laid low i must say that mind would have fallen too and may therefore be thought to show discretion in not putting forward a similar claim and if pleasure were deprived not only of the first but of the second place she would be terribly damaged in the eyes of her admirers for not even to them would she still appear as fair as before socrates well but had we not better leave her now and not pain her by applying the crucial test and finally detecting her protarchus nonsense socrates socrates why because i said that we had better not pain pleasure which is an impossibility protarchus yes and more than that because you do not seem to be aware that none of us will let you go home until you have finished the argument socrates heavens protarchus that will be a tedious business and just at present not at all an easy one for in going to war in the cause of mind who is aspiring to the second prize i ought to have weapons of another make from those which i used before some however of the old ones may do again and must i then finish the argument protarchus of course you must socrates let us be very careful in laying the foundation protarchus what do you mean socrates let us divide all existing things into two or rather if you do not object into three classes protarchus upon what principle would you make the division socrates let us take some of our newly found notions protarchus which of them socrates were we not saying that god revealed a finite element of existence and also an infinite protarchus certainly socrates let us assume these two principles and also a third which is compounded out of them but i fear that i am ridiculously clumsy at these processes of division and enumeration protarchus what do you mean my good friend socrates i say that a fourth class is still wanted protarchus what will that be socrates find the cause of the third or compound and add this as a fourth class to the three others protarchus and would you like to have a fifth class or cause of resolution as well as a cause of composition socrates not i think at present but if i want a fifth at some future time you shall allow me to have it protarchus certainly socrates 
let us begin with the first three and as we find two out of the three greatly divided and dispersed let us endeavour to reunite them and see how in each of them there is a one and many protarchus if you would explain to me a little more about them perhaps i might be able to follow you socrates well the two classes are the same which i mentioned before one the finite and the other the infinite i will first show that the infinite is in a certain sense many and the finite may be hereafter discussed protarchus i agree socrates and now consider well for the question to which i invite your attention is difficult and controverted when you speak of hotter and colder can you conceive any limit in those qualities does not the more and less which dwells in their very nature prevent their having any end for if they had an end the more and less would themselves have an end protarchus that is most true socrates ever as we say into the hotter and the colder there enters a more and a less protarchus yes socrates then says the argument there is never any end of them and being endless they must also be infinite protarchus yes socrates that is exceedingly true socrates yes my dear protarchus and your answer reminds me that such an expression as exceedingly which you have just uttered and also the term gently have the same significance as more or less for whenever they occur they do not allow of the existence of quantity they are always introducing degrees into actions instituting a comparison of a more or a less excessive or a more or a less gentle and at each creation of more or less quantity disappears for as i was just now saying if quantity and measure did not disappear but were allowed to intrude in the sphere of more and less and the other comparatives these last would be driven out of their own domain when definite quantity is once admitted there can be no longer a hotter or a colder for these are always progressing and are never in one stay but definite quantity is at rest and has ceased to progress which proves that comparatives such as the hotter and the colder are to be ranked in the class of the infinite protarchus your remark certainly has the look of truth socrates but these subjects as you were saying are difficult to follow at first i think however that if i could hear the argument repeated by you once or twice there would be a substantial agreement between us socrates yes and i will try to meet your wish but as i would rather not waste time in the enumeration of endless particulars let me know whether i may not assume as a note of the infinite protarchus what socrates i want to know whether such things as appear to us to admit of more or less or are denoted by the words exceedingly gently extremely and the like may not be referred to the class of the infinite which is their unity for as was asserted in the previous argument all things that were divided and dispersed should be brought together and have the mark or seal of some one nature if possible set upon them do you remember protarchus yes socrates and all things which do not admit of more or less but admit their opposites that is to say first of all equality and the equal or again the double or any other ratio of number and measure all these may i think be rightly reckoned by us in the class of the limited or finite what do you say protarchus excellent socrates socrates and now what nature shall we ascribe to the third or compound kind protarchus you i think will have to tell me that socrates rather god will tell you if there be any god who will listen to my prayers protarchus offer up a prayer then and think socrates i am thinking protarchus and i believe that some god has befriended us protarchus what do you mean and what proof have you to offer of what you are saying socrates i will tell you and do you listen to my words protarchus proceed socrates were we not speaking just now of hotter and colder protarchus true socrates add to them drier wetter more less swifter slower greater smaller and all that in the preceding argument we placed under the unity of more and less protarchus in the class of the infinite you mean socrates yes and now mingle this with the other protarchus 
what is the other socrates the class of the finite which we ought to have brought together as we did the infinite but perhaps it will come to the same thing if we do so now when the two are combined a third will appear protarchus what do you mean by the class of the finite socrates the class of the equal and the double and any class which puts an end to difference and opposition and by introducing number creates harmony and proportion among the different elements protarchus i understand you seem to me to mean that the various opposites when you mingle with them the class of the finite take certain forms socrates yes that is my meaning protarchus proceed socrates does not the right participation in the finite give health in disease for instance protarchus certainly socrates and whereas the high and low the swift and the slow are infinite or unlimited does not the addition of the principles aforesaid introduce a limit and perfect the whole frame of music protarchus yes certainly socrates or again when cold and heat prevail does not the introduction of them take away excess and indefiniteness and infuse moderation and harmony protarchus certainly socrates and from a like admixture of the finite and infinite come the seasons and all the delights of life protarchus most true socrates i omit ten thousand other things such as beauty and health and strength and the many beauties and high perfections of the soul oh my beautiful philobos the goddess methinks seeing the universal wantonness and wickedness of all things and that there was in them no limit to pleasures and self-indulgence devised the limit of law and order whereby as you say philobos she torments or as i maintain delivers the soul what think you protarchus protarchus her ways are much to my mind socrates socrates you will observe that i have spoken of three classes protarchus yes i think that i understand you you mean to say that the infinite is one class and that the finite is a second class of existences but what you would make the third i am not so certain socrates that is because the amazing variety of the third class is too much for you my dear friend but there was not this difficulty with the infinite which also comprehended many classes for all of them were sealed with the note of more and less and therefore appeared one protarchus true socrates and the finite or limit had not many divisions and we readily acknowledged it to be by nature one protarchus yes socrates yes indeed and when i speak of the third class understand me to mean any offspring of these being a birth into true being affected by the measure which the limit introduces protarchus i understand socrates still there was as we said a fourth class to be investigated and you must assist in the investigation for does not everything which comes into being of necessity come into being through a cause protarchus yes certainly for how can there be anything which has no cause socrates and is not the agent the same as the cause in all except name the agent and the cause may be rightly called one protarchus very true socrates and the same may be said of the patient or effect we shall find that they too differ as i was saying only in name shall we not protarchus we shall socrates the agent or cause always naturally leads and the patient or effect naturally follows it protarchus certainly socrates then the cause and what is subordinate to it in generation are not the same but different protarchus true socrates did not the things which were generated and the things out of which they were generated furnish all the three classes protarchus yes socrates and the creator or cause of them has been satisfactorily proven to be distinct from them and may therefore be called a fourth principle protarchus so let us call it socrates quite right but now having distinguished the four i think that we had better refresh our memories by recapitulating each of them in order protarchus by all means socrates then the first i will call the infinite or unlimited and the second the finite or limited then follows the third an essence compound and generated 
and i do not think that i shall be far wrong in speaking of the cause of mixture and generation as the fourth protarchus certainly not socrates and now what is the next question and how came we hither were we not inquiring whether the second place belonged to pleasure or wisdom protarchus we were socrates and now having determined these points shall we not be better able to decide about the first and second place which was the original subject of dispute protarchus i dare say socrates we said if you remember that the mixed life of pleasure and wisdom was the conqueror did we not protarchus true socrates and we see what is the place and nature of this life and to what class it is to be assigned protarchus beyond a doubt socrates this is evidently comprehended in the third or mixed class which is not composed of any two particular ingredients but of all the elements of infinity bound down by the finite and may therefore be truly said to comprehend the conqueror life protarchus most true socrates and what shall we say philebus of your life which is all sweetness and in which of the aforesaid classes is that to be placed perhaps you will allow me to ask you a question before you answer philebus let me hear socrates have pleasure and pain a limit or do they belong to the class which admits of more and less philebus they belong to the class which admits of more socrates for pleasure would not be perfectly good if she were not infinite in quantity and degree socrates nor would pain philebus be perfectly evil and therefore the infinite cannot be that element which imparts to pleasure some degree of good but now admitting if you like that pleasure is of the nature of the infinite in which of the aforesaid classes o protarchus and philebus can we without irreverence place wisdom and knowledge and mind and let us be careful for i think that the danger will be very serious if we err on this point philebus you magnify socrates the importance of your favourite god socrates and you my friend are also magnifying your favourite goddess but still i must beg you to answer the question protarchus socrates is quite right philebus and we must submit to him philebus and did not you protarchus propose to answer in my place protarchus certainly i did but i am now in a great strait and i must entreat you socrates to be our spokesman and then we shall not say anything wrong or disrespectful of your favourite socrates i must obey you protarchus nor is the task which you impose a difficult one but did i really as philebus implies disconcert you with my playful solemnity when i asked the question to what class mind and knowledge belong protarchus you did indeed socrates socrates yet the answer is easy since all philosophers assert with one voice that mind is the king of heaven and earth in reality they are magnifying themselves and perhaps they are right but still i should like to consider the class of mind if you do not object a little more fully philebus take your own course socrates and never mind length we shall not tire of you and of part one of philebus recording in memory of mitchell edwards